Tonight, a former ghost hunter talks about his experiences with the paranormal and what the Bible has to say about ghosts. So turn on all the lights, hold someone's hand, and get ready to hide under your blanket because the Halloween episode of the God Makes New podcast starts now. Welcome to the God Makes New Podcast. My name is Dane Deutschman, creator and host of the podcast. Watch us on YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, or Gab, and listen on all major podcast platforms. Please remember to subscribe and turn on notifications, and visit our website, godmakesnew.org, for transcripts, source references, and more. Today, we have with us former ghost hunter, biblical theologian, and author of Biblical Explanations, The Paranormal, Daniel McAdams. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. How'd you like my intro? I thought that was an awesome intro. (laughs) Yeah, I tried. We'll see. A little corny, but that's okay. (laughs) Yeah, a little corny Uh, is what we need sometimes. Exactly. It keeps it real. You've got this awesome book that you sent me. Uh, I read through it, and it's all about your story about, you know, becoming a ghost hunter, some of your childhood experiences and um, just how you got into ghost hunting and then how you kind of realized that what, what it really, what was really behind it and how it relates to the Bible. Um, so I, I just, uh, maybe if you can just kind of go through your, introduce yourself briefly, uh, maybe just tell us a little bit more about yourself and go ahead and start telling us your story. And I have a few questions, but we can just kind of get into it and let the conversation flow. That sounds good. So uh, my name's Daniel McAdams. I was a former paranormal investigator. I specialized in the ghost and haunting side of paranormal investigation. When you think about paranormal investigation, there's really four major branches of paranormal investigation. You have ghost and haunting phenomena, ufology, um, cryptozoology, and parapsychology. And of those four, I really specialized in and spent most of those 10 years uh, looking for ghosts and haunting phenomena. And I grew up as a Christian. I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was four years old. I was raised in a very strong, conservative Christian household. Every Sunday, I went to church. When high school came around, I was involved in two youth groups. I even got involved on my church's worship team. But shortly after high school, I became fascinated by the paranormal and jumped in with both feet, so to say. And Hmm. funny story, what got me interested in the paranormal was not something that you would normally expect. So I guess you could call it paranormal. Hmm. It was actually roller coasters. I was watching Hmm. a show about roller coasters one day because I'm a roller coaster fanatic. And if I can't be riding roller coasters, then watching shows about roller coasters is the next best thing. And (laughs) Travel Channel had a marathon on, and the last episode came up, and a preview for the next show that they were going to play came on. And the next show they were going to play was uh, America's Eight Most Haunted. And I saw that and was like, okay, I want to sleep tonight without having nightmares, because I don't know about you, but I don't like having nightmares when I sleep. So I watched the roller coaster episode. It ended. I looked around for the remote. But by the time I found the remote and looked back at the TV, the intro for America's Eight Most Haunted had started. And I mm. saw a building come up on the intro that I was familiar with, the Stanley Hotel. And I got to wondering why was that building considered one of America's Eight Most Haunted buildings? I'd been to Estes Park. I'd seen that building for myself. It was in my home state. Um, I grew up in Colorado. I now live in Missouri. And so that just got me really curious. And I ended up watching the whole episode. And by the end, I was enthralled by what I saw, and I wanted to have those experiences that were shown on the show. I wanted to go to those locations, get that kind of evidence for myself, and just see Mm. for myself if this was real or not. Mm. And discovered, so that was back in 2010. And then in 2011, I discovered that my best friend Dylan also had an interest in paranormal investigation. And even though we were both Christians, we both thought that, hey, there's something to this ghost and haunting thing. Let's go out there together and try to figure it out. And as two best friends do, 
we jumped in together and didn't look back until 2019. And from 2011 until 2019, we had our own paranormal investigation team. It really became almost like our full-time job. It was both of our passions. We were either out in the field investigating in our free time, or if we weren't investigating, we were researching, analyzing our evidence, uh, editing together videos and documentaries from what uh, from our investigations, and just all around. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We just completely committed ourselves to trying to figure out what this was all about, and okay. in reconciling it with a Christian faith, there was once uh, two stories actually from the Bible that I really thought was my golden ticket to being able to be a Christian and a ghost hunter at the same time. And um, these stories have been one when Jesus is walking on the water to the boat where the disciples are at, and the disciples saw him and they thought that he was a ghost. And I thought it was interesting that Jesus never rebuked them for thinking he was a ghost. He didn't tell them that ghosts weren't real. He didn't say anything about them being silly stories or that they had anything wrong with believing in ghosts. And then that time after his resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples in the locked room, and once again, they thought he was a ghost. And once again, it's not recorded that Jesus said anything about them believing in ghosts. Hmm. So I thought those two stories there were the key to being able to be a Christian and a ghost turner at the same time. It's kind of an affirmation of the reality of ghosts. Exactly. Just but little more to it. <laughs> yeah. Little did I know <clears throat> that actually it wasn't an affirmation of ghosts being real. It was just the cultural belief at the time that the disciples were interpreting, interpreting. That's an interpreting, yeah. interpreting <laughs> their experience through, or they're interpreting their experience through okay. their cultural beliefs and sure. perceptions. Okay. And Jesus instead said, Hey, this is me. I'm the real thing. Hmm. I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in me. Hmm. And I didn't see that at the time. I didn't see that until after the fact. So from mm -hmm. 2011 to 2019, we were just super actively involved. And then in, like involved to the point where we were writing articles on online, we were speaking at paranormal conferences, we were speaking mm -hmm. at horror film festivals, being paranormal investigators actually got us to be hired on as producers of a horror film festival back in Colorado because of our involvement with them. Mm -hmm. And we were starting to have it made, so to say, as paranormal investigators. And from the get-go, we were wanting to become known for being reliable um, experts and sound in how we went about things. And mm. by 2019, we were starting to be known for that. Mm. And then there was a pivotal event that happened for me back in 2019. In May of okay. 2019, I had an investigation coming up with my team. And the job I was working at, I was working in media production. And I was driving back from a shoot with our boss at the time, and he was a Christian, and he knew that I was a Christian and a ghost hunter as well. And he was asking me a lot of questions about the paranormal. Hmm. And after about four or five questions, I realized that all my answers were along the lines of, well, there's this theory. Well, some people think this. Well, we think that. Hmm. Well, it could be this. It could be that. And I think he realized that too, because at one point he just kind of chuckled and goes, well, that's why you go out into the field to find these answers, right? And that kind of mm -hmm. hit me like a punch in the gut because I'd gone to school online getting certifications in the paranormal. Like I said, okay. we talked at conferences. Yeah. We yeah. put out a lot of media online. We'd spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of our lives dedicated to this. And yeah. I thought I was an expert. And then I realized yeah. I don't have one single solid actual answer to any of the questions that he just asked me. Yeah. Yeah. And then he finally asked, me well what do you think ghosts and spirits are espousing a lot of the common theories about what ghosts and spirits are and by the mm -hmm. time i finished rattling those off a thought came from out of the blue that i hadn't considered since i started investigating and i just blurted out out of nowhere and there's a possibility they're all actually demons mm. and that hit me like a punch in the gut too because that's not something i had considered mm. was that not was that something that they taught you in the school did that was that never a a uh, possibility in the minds of the 
like the training curriculum and all, and all that? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, um, the school that I went to studying parapsychology. Oh, okay. They talked about it was parapsychology specializing. Let me back up. So how far I fell from being a Christian and how blind I became, the degree I actually pursued was metaphysical humanistic science specializing in parapsychology. Okay. And it focused a whole lot on the paranormal, and along with that came the certification as a paranormal investigator being backed by the school. Hmm. And the professor, he didn't believe in demons that they were real. He said that he used to be a Christian. But then the more he got involved with the paranormal, he realized that demons were just kind of made up, as he said. Hmm. And that was all just religious because he said he'd gone on many investigations and challenged demons by name, called out Satan himself, and never had any single demonic type experience happen to him. And, and never occurred to him that they might be deceiving him. Exactly. He took yeah. it as that showed the <clears throat> demons aren't real. And that was a point of contention that, that I had one of the things I disagreed with him on. And I actually, yeah. in one of my papers that I wrote, challenged him on it. And he, he uh, nicely disagreed with me, still passed me for it. <laughs> but uh, it's good. But that was something I always believed even throughout my investigation period. And the yeah. time at school was that demons were real. But yeah. as you've, if you watch ghost adventures or listen to paranormal podcasts or read paranormal literature, you're going to hear most ghost hunters out there say that demons, while they exist, they are very, very rare. And that mm. if you become a ghost hunter, it's very unlikely that you'll ever encounter demonic haunting. Mm -hmm. Basically, all hauntings that you have are benevolent spirits of just dead people that are sticking around. And mm -hmm. that was something that I was preaching to when I would mm. talk about things. It's like, yeah, demons, you don't have to worry about those. Yeah, it's possible that you can run into them but it's super rare. Yeah. So okay. that was, so it was something that I had in the back of my mind. And when I'd first gotten into paranormal investigation, I kind of butted heads with my church that I was attending at the time over it. Mm -hmm. And they tried to point me to the Bible saying, well, the Bible says this is wrong. God says this is wrong, mm -hmm. but they weren't answering all the questions from a scientific standpoint, which is where I was trying to approach it from. Well, what are the answers to all the paranormal theories then? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, the Bible says witchcraft, divination, necromancy, trying to summon spirits of the dead are wrong. But I didn't feel that I was doing that. I felt that mm -hmm. I was going out there trying to get scientific evidence showing how ghosts exist, whether mm -hmm. they exist or not, like just how they operated. Basically mm -hmm. trying to find a scientific explanation for it. Sure. Yeah. So by the 2019, I'd become so blind to how far spiritually I had become involved in this pursuit as well. So it was a gradual kind of, it was a gradual kind of sucking in exactly. into it. Yeah. So okay. even as a Christian, I was heavily, heavily deceived and blinded to mm. what exactly was going on. Mm. And then I had that out of the blue thought when I was talking to my boss. Mm. And once those words left my mouth, I kind of sat back and was quiet for the rest of the ride back to the office. And was contemplating, well, where'd that thought come from? Like, is that even a possibility? Mm -hmm. So I got home and I started to think, well, what are demons exactly? It's like, well, the Bible says demons are fallen angels. And for the first time in my almost decade-long career as a paranormal investigator, I picked up the Bible to look inside the Bible to see what it had to say about angels. And after a couple of weeks of reading up on angels, and what the Bible says angels can do, I had answered basically 90% of the questions that I had not answered through uh, paranormal investigation about what mm. the paranormal is and ghosts and all that. So you actually got solid answers <clears throat> from the Bible, whereas before you were like, uh, you know, you never really got any solid answers. I, I think that's interesting how like, and you see this on a lot of the paranormal shows that are on. It's always, they always end like this. We'll never know if Bigfoot exists, but we can keep trying and we don't know what these phenomena are, but uh, they sure are weird. And maybe someday we'll know. I mean, that's every UFO show 
every paranormal show that you've ever watched. Exactly. That's the ending. Yeah. And that was something I'd never, never noticed or considered as a, as I was involved in paranormal investigation. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I started reading the Bible and started kind of pulling myself out of that, that sphere and looking at things through a biblical perspective that I would mm-hmm. watch shows like Ghost Adventures, um, Ghost Hunters, and other paranormal shows on YouTube. And I was like, wait, they actually haven't answered any questions. Sure, they have mm-hmm. some possible answers to things, but mm-hmm. they don't actually have any objective answers, just like yeah. I realized when I was talking to my boss. Yeah, that is interesting. And, you know, one of the pet peeves I have about some of those shows, too, is they'll investigate this residence or hotel or something, and they'll sit down with the person, the client afterwards, and they're, they're telling them, well, you know, we, we, here's what we found. Here's the EVPs we found. Uh, we did some research on the history of the place, and we found that someone did die here or whatever. And you know what? we think they're just a friendly ghost and you'll be fine. You just need to live with them and just uh, you're safe. Don't worry about it and call us back when you need more help. It will will come, but you should be fine. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what help did they give? First of all, exactly. All, All they did was record some phenomena. And secondly, how did they know really? I mean, all they maybe got was a couple of hits on a, little device or an EVP or something, how do they know really anything about that to tell that person that? And I'm just exactly. like, you guys, you guys, you guys did nothing. You just recorded a bunch of evidence <laughs> and are yeah, speculating. That's yeah, it. You got called to this yeah. haunted location because they think it's haunted and want to know more. And mm. all the answer is, is yep. We think it's haunted. Call us back. If you need us to help. <laughs> yep. It's, it's like, haunted. Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that, that That's right. didn't That's really right. go anywhere, but yeah, we know it's haunted now. And yeah. I think it's interesting because if you watch Ghost Adventures, especially, uh-huh. like I realized how guilty I was of this. Like mm. you start out and they, they start out asking some questions. And so you sit down to watch it. And even if you sit down to watch it critically to try to get these questions answered for yourself, the mm-hmm. way they do the show, by the time the show's done, you're sitting back going, wow, I want to go to that location. I want to have those experiences. Those experiences mm-hmm. they had, the evidence they captured was awesome, but you've completely forgotten about any of the questions or objective uh, yeah. thinking that you had done at the beginning. Yeah, Ghost Adventures in particular is, I mean, those guys are like, they're, they're more cool. They're like, they're more, they're, they're cooler guys than the Ghost Hunter guy. You know, like the original Ghost Hunter guys are kind of more nerdy, but the Ghost Adventures guys, they have that going for them where they're kind of cool. And they pick on Aaron. <clears throat> they make him go to the basement and stuff, you know. Yep. And uh, the thing about them too is, is they entice the demonic with the their provoking of it, and then they claim that that's getting them better, uh, better hits on their their cameras and things. But if you look at, I mean, if you look at Zach Baggins. I mean, I, I think that guy has got some serious dark spirituality attached to him. And that whole team probably oh, yeah. does. And so you really look at that. And I often watch that and think it's really sad because these guys are like just totally lost. And like you explained, they just start getting sucked in more and more and more. Um, and it's entertaining, but at what cost? I mean... Uh, yep. th- that show has been on for quite a while. And I just, Ghost if Adventures. you think about how they started when they were young and now look at the demeanor and the type of people they are now, and you can see it, you can see the darkness in them. It's I really interesting. You notice that. Oh yeah. Because like when they started out back in 2004 with their, their future length documentary ghost adventures, they were seriously just going out there as film school students. They all have a background in film. Um, and they were seriously just going out there with a curiosity, trying to see this firsthand for themselves, just trying to see if this was real or not, and try to capture some evidence on film. Like, And that's really how I got started, too, Dylan and I. That's how, what we went out to do. We were curious and just wanted to see for ourselves if this was real and capture evidence of it and see if we couldn't maybe get that golden nugget that would tell us what the paranormal was. 
Mm-hmm. But then as you watch ghost, uh, as you watch ghost adventures and the seasons go on and on and on and on and on. Mm. Now, almost two decades later, they're still asking the same questions they had back in 2004. They just yeah. reword it in a different way. They don't <laughs> present it as questions. They don't say, we're trying to figure this out, but they present theories now that are still along the same lines of what they were looking for back in 2004. Mm. All they've really mm-hmm. proved is that strange stuff happens and that there is mm. a spiritual side to this world. Mm-hmm. They haven't really explained or figured out what it was. And mm-hmm. as you've watched Zach throughout the course of this, he went from somebody who was just kind of being like an on-screen personality, acting tough and having some fun, to now he he actively seeks out objects from serial killers. He buys mm-hmm. objects from like massacres and that have dark evil histories and connotations behind them to add to a museum that he owns in Las Vegas. And Mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting to watch how he went from being scared of the demonic to now he embraces the dark side and the darkness and he surrounds himself with that all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the potential for him to hear the gospel, I mean, is probably, it's probably much harder for him. And as you mentioned in your book, um, I forget which, which biblical reference you gave, but uh, one of the Bible verses talks about being blind, that the God of this world has blinded uh, unbelievers, basically. Yep. And so he's so caught up in that that he's blind to seeking. There's no incentive for him to seek God. to um another thing you talked about in there i'm trying to remember right now what it was but oh it was the instant gratification piece of all this i think it was the section where you were talking about mediums and uh all throughout history you know obviously there's been this necromancy under various forms and uh or just contact the occult in various forms Mm -hmm. and i think pride has been such a big part of that Pr- pride and instant gratification for people. So oh, yeah. in- instead of, instead of whatever pain you're in, whatever season of life that you might be going through, or if there's a death or something, instead of letting God sanctify you through the pain, through the years, through what the Holy spirit is working in you. And that can take time. You might want the instant gratification of, my loved one's safe or some little token of acknowledgement from the other side and this belief in they're looking over you, they're watching over you kind of belief. And it's interesting too, because <clears throat> that really places that really lines heavily with humanism and self deification because mm. you're looking at your ancestors or your grandmother, your mom, your son, your daughter, your friend, yeah looking to know, well, are they safe? Are they watching over me? Uh And you still want to feel the presence with you instead of turning to the Bible where we know God is always with us. Like as Christians, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is always with us. We know that he's always watching over us. We have that assurance Mm -hmm. ourselves and we know, and we know that if our loved ones Mm -hmm. die as believers, that they're in heaven, we are going to see them again one day. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is the ultimate comfort that people are missing out on because of this and because of how this all seems so, 
how do you want to say shallow trite it, it seems entertaining it seems light it doesn't seem like something heavy and serious necessarily there's, until there's a, a tang- an almost tangible um like personal aspect to it like you're getting that the actual voices you're getting mm-hmm. actual communication whether through evp through an experience through a medium you're getting some sort of communicated verbal message back from the beyond yeah instead of relying on the bible being god's word to you and knowing that eternity is is awaiting those of us whether as believers in heaven or non-believers in hell yeah yeah because okay, people well, want, um, they want something sorry no, people ahead. want something real and they think the bible is just an old book of good wisdom that was changed and manipulated yeah. over the yeah. thousands of years that it was written. Yeah. But they don't see how a book that was written thousands of years ago can apply to them. But mm-hmm. then you have the spiritual outlets, mediums, ghost hunting, um, Ouija boards, tarot cards that seem to be providing instant, tangible, real answers and communication for you. Mm-hmm. And with this instant gratification, see it to believe it's society. Mm-hmm. Their focus turns more on what feels more real to them. Yeah. I like what you said about the um, <clears throat> the idolatry and kind of how it ma- it matches up with uh, a lot of other religions and the fact that they venerate their ancestors. So there's, you know, the, the veneration aspect of in Africa, in some places, they'll dig up their dead every year and dance around with them and then put them back in the grave right or just um ancient mesopotamia there was a lot of ancestor worship involved there as well with some of the practices that they oh, yeah. they were concerned about making sure that they gave sacrifices and offerings to their ancestors or else their belief was that their ancestors would not um have anything to eat in the afterlife this sort of thing. And it's just, it's this connection to the person that you knew uh, in this sort of false way that, yeah, instant gratification. But uh, people don't think about the fact that I think that that's what this is when you're believing in ghosts, when you're consulting a medium or a psychic and things like that, because it's in a different context. It's in the context of 21st century and our culture. But if you really think about it, it's no different than ancient religions, ancient pagan religions, occult practices throughout the centuries. So, like this has been going on since almost the beginning of this world. Yeah. When you look at the Bible, when God was giving Moses the law, this is back in 1450 BC, Mm. 3,400 years ago. He specifically says, do not consult the dead, do not consult spiritists, no necromancy, no witchcraft. Mm-hmm. They, those beliefs, which sound so much like criminal investigation today, were active way back then, 3,400 years ago. And they mm-hmm. haven't changed much now, except <clears throat> now yeah. we see it as a, a scientific endeavor with mm. scientific technology going out there trying to find scientific answers for a spiritual world. Yeah. And if you think about, that's a great example, like scientifics. So if you think about like an EVP, I can see how someone would think, well, this is just, I'm just collecting scientific evidence, but really you're collecting answers to questions from the dead. Well, not from the dead, but from demons. Exactly. From, from, from a spirit being on the other side. And what does that sound like? Divination. Divination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and it actually is divination. <laughs> it is. And that's something I didn't understand either when I had that, that confrontation in my church back in 2011, mm-hmm. I believe it was. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that that was the same thing as divination. I thought divination was trying to like summon a demon to get some secret yeah. knowledge that <laughs> nobody else knew about. I thought I was just going out there to get, get answers, get mm-hmm. some uh, evidence so that I could go back and analyze it and try to figure out what exactly was going on. But like you said, you're going out there, you're recording that EVP. Before you know it, you're asking questions like, how did you die? Is there anything you want to communicate yeah. to somebody that you didn't get to when you were alive? 
And mm-hmm. even though I was a Christian and believed in heaven and hell as the only two alternatives that we died, I didn't realize just how far I'd gotten blinded spiritually and mm-hmm. that I had fallen for that too, where I was asking questions as if we could die and still stick around on the earth. What I knew but hadn't internalized and kept in my mind when I began investigating was that the Bible only teaches two things that happen to us after we die. And that is that if you're a believer, you die and you go to heaven. If you're a non-believer, you die and go to hell. There is no third option of being able to stay around as ghosts. And when I first approached criminal investigation, that was kind of my mindset. And I was kind of careful about how I did things. But mm-hmm. the more I'd watch Ghost Adventures, the more I'd research, the more I got involved in it. By 2019, that had basically all gone out the window. I still believe mm-hmm. in heaven and hell. And even though I didn't, I didn't consciously say or believe that we could still stick around on Earth after we died. There was enough evidence that made it seem like it was a possibility that some spirits, some humans, still stuck around on Earth after you died. Hmm. So that's kind of how my whole perspective changed. And then hmm. once I came out of this and started looking at it from a biblical perspective, it's like I realized, well, the Bible, it only teaches two ways. So any third option that is contrary, so if the Bible only teaches two ways, then any third option can be rejected as a false option right off the bat. And the Bible teaches Mm -hmm. heaven or hell. It doesn't teach stick around as ghosts. And how Mm -hmm. do we know that that's true? Because, well, the Bible's truth. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven and says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And what is your word? Your word is God's word, and God's word is the Bible. And how do we know Mm -hmm. the Bible is true? Well, we have two examples from within Scripture itself. In the Old Testament, when Moses was writing the law back in 1450 BC or so, he writes in Numbers 23, 19, that God is not human, that he should lie, not a human being, that he should change his mind. And then in the New Testament, about 50 AD, 60 AD or so, Paul is writing to Titus, and he writes in Titus 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, and start that over. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, and the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. So one of God's attributes that we know is that he cannot lie. Mm-hmm. And if he cannot lie, then his word cannot lie. And if his word mm-hmm. cannot lie, then that means there are only two options for us humans after we die. That is heaven mm-hmm. or hell. And that means that The third option of being able to stick around as ghosts is a false option and a lie of the sage. Hmm. So did you, when you were, uh, before you got into that or in the early days when you first started to get into it, did you have a high view of scripture like sola scriptura at that time? Or were you kind of fuzzy on it? Or was it more like what, how, how did that transition take place? That's, kind of a very interesting transition because I'd grown up in the church, but I don't believe I'd ever actually internalized my faith for myself. That was what I'd grown Mm. up. I believed in Jesus. I believed he was real. That was something I'd never pushed to the side. I walked away from the church for a time when I first got started in criminal investigation, just because we butted heads over it. Yeah. But I never gave up my faith. I never didn't believe in Jesus and never rejected him. I just kind of put him to the side and wanted to see for myself what the paranormal was all about. Mm-hmm. And growing up, I did believe the Bible was God's word. I'd never heard the term sola scriptura before until about 2019, actually. Mm. Um, so even though I did, I had a high view of God's word. I didn't mm-hmm. think it held the answers to the questions I was seeking because mm. in my my confrontation in my church, I didn't get the answers to what I was seeking. Okay. It's like I thought it just just pushed yeah. aside witchcraft divination, which at the time, like, like I said, I didn't realize what I was doing was divination, necromancy yeah. and, and all that. So I didn't yeah. think it actually held the answers to what I wanted. And at the beginning of this uh of the podcast when I mentioned the two the two passages where the disciples thought Jesus was a ghost. Between not getting the answers I was seeking right off the bat and those two passages in scripture, I thought, 
Well, the Bible supports it. I'm in the mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. Not realizing that that was a me reading into the text something. Yeah. And not actually what the Bible was actually teaching. And were and you so excited? Wasn't... Were you excited to do it too? Was it like you weren't necessarily looking at the scripture for I'm going to do what the Bible says as much as you were, I'm going to try to make the Bible say so that it can support what I want to do. Like I, what I want to do was kind of like in your mind as, or, or how, how was that? How how was your, uh, how were you approaching that at that time? Honestly, from about 2011 to about 2015, 2016, Hmm. I'd really walked away from the church. I would go to church on some Sundays. Yeah. Um, but it was more just to keep up that I'm a good Christian boy type look mm. for my parents. Mm. Mm-hmm. I had I wasn't really pursuing it for myself. And so I wasn't really turning to scripture at all outside of the time I'd opened the Bible in church. And I wasn't really trying to twist scripture to fit what I wanted it to say. I wasn't really going to the Bible in an effort to make it support parental investigation. I mm. just knew that one, what God said in the Leviticus and Deuteronomy didn't seem to apply to me. And two, mm. the two passages in the New Testament concerning the disciples thinking Jesus was a ghost, I mm. thought was enough to justify being a, a ghost hunter and a Christian. And okay. that was about the extent that I really looked into the Bible <clears throat> to justify what I was doing, if you want to say that. Sure. Okay. And it wasn't until 2019 that. I looked in the Bible and realized, wow, the Bible has a whole lot more answers than I realized it held. It's like, what else does it hold in here for me? Mm. And that's when so I was, really fell in love with scripture. Okay. So was 2019 when you talked to your boss or let's pick up where, where you left off with your boss. So you were talking to your boss and you're like, it's popped into your head. Oh, well it could be demons. So then what happened after that? Like, and when, when, what time frame is that? Is like is 2019 was that 2019 or was, did that come later? That was 2019. 2019 okay. is a huge year for me. It was the biggest year for me as a paranormal investigator, and it was also the biggest year for me uh, in my walk with God too. Because it started out, we got to investigate in January of 2019. We got to investigate a huge military museum in Colorado. We were only the second paranormal investigation team allowed to investigate there. And we had some pretty crazy evidence. We got asked to talk at a paranormal convention that year. We got asked to lead a ghost hunt for that convention. We had multiple excellent investigations that year, capturing evidence above and beyond anything we'd captured before, including mm-hmm. some evidence that if we had stayed in the paranormal, we probably could have gotten nationally recognized for because what we captured doing one of the investigations is above and beyond anything I've ever seen ghost adventures put out, ghost hunters put out or things put out on YouTube. Even it Mm. blew all of us away that experienced it. But May, 2019 is when I had this talk with my boss a week or so later, we had a big investigation at a location that we'd investigated multiple times and loved going to, and we had an excellent investigation and as you'll read in the last chapter of my book in the conclusion, 2019 was a huge wrestling, wrestling match between me and what I wanted to do and God trying mm-hmm. to pull me out of what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And the more I started looking at the Bible, the more I started to question just what the paranormal was all about, and what I was actually doing. Mm-hmm. And the more I started to question that, the bigger and better the evidence was and activity was that we were experiencing on the paranormal side. Mm-hmm. And sometime, probably about June and July, I texted Dylan and just said, hey, what if ghosts are actually demons? And that got both of us to start discussing it again, because that's not something he had discussed, or that's not something he had thought about since we had first started as well. And that's not something we had discussed since we first started. And that was something that we had kind of decided was just the conservative Christian response to keep people from actually pursuing this because they were scared of it or because we thought mm-hmm. Christians just didn't really realize that ghosts were real or that they didn't want to believe it. Mm-hmm. So we started to discuss it some more. And then in August of 2019, 
another big, big chapter in my life. In August of 2019 is when I moved from Colorado to Missouri. And a couple of days before that move is when we spoke at the convention. We led a ghost hunt. We spoke. And we had actually, I had another huge realization that really affirmed what I had been looking into that ghosts and spirits are actually demons during mm. that conference. And there was a very well-known psychic who lives in Colorado. She and her team are pretty well-known. I'm not going to disclose the team name or her name. Um, okay. But she was very well-known. I'd been at another paranormal conference with her a couple of days before. I'd gone to a talk that she'd done. And she and her team were leading this, this convention. So the first night of the convention was just like a public ghost hunt that Dylan and I led, then a Q&A session. The next day was all the talks and then another ghost hunt which we got to lead. And that was also the time that we captured the evidence that blew our minds. Hmm. Then the next day was my last day in Colorado. And then the following day is when we left from Missouri. Well, the Q&A session following the first night at the convention was hosted by by this medium and since we were just asked to lead the ghost hunt part we just sat back and didn't get involved with the q a session we just let her handle it because we went once to try to steal the limelight we enjoyed being in front of people talking about what we believe and what mm -hmm. we did but we also want ones to just jump in front of everybody else and try to steal the spotlight mm -hmm. so we just kind of sat back to listen to what she had to say for the q a session and at one point, somebody in the audience asked, well, how do you know that ghosts and spirits are real? So I was really curious to see what she was going to have to say to this. So I leaned forward, and she goes, you know, that was something I struggled with for a while. And I did some research on it and went to the field and all, but still couldn't quite figure out the answers. So then I decided to reach out to my familiar spirits. And... So she talked before about how she'd reach out to familiar spirits to like answer questions for people and, and whatnot. She's mm -hmm. like, so I reached out to my familiar spirits. And after a little bit, one of them came through to me and they reminded me of the greatest ghost that ever lived, Jesus. Because he came back and his disciples could touch him. Mm -hmm. He ate like he was the best ghost that ever existed. <laughs> and that's how we know that ghosts are real. And I... Like that's I wasn't super well versed in the Bible at that time, but I knew mm -hmm. enough that as soon as she said that, I sat back like I had been hit in the chest with a sledgehammer, mm -hmm. and it was like that's demonic. Yeah, I'm like that. I'm like Jesus came back physically, bodily as a living human being. He raised yeah. from the dead. He didn't come back as a ghost. He even says in the Bible, "I am not a ghost. As a ghost to eat." give me some food to eat because I'm hungry and yeah. prove that he wasn't a ghost. And the belief, what they believe ghosts were back in Jesus's time hasn't changed at all from what we believe ghosts are in our time today. Mm -hmm. So he disproved the notion that he was a ghost. So I couldn't believe what I was hearing this medium say. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wow, that, that just validated this whole path I've been going down about the fact that ghosts and spirits are all actually demons mm -hmm. and That's then on the drive pretty crazy to, on the drive out to missouri dylan came out with me he helped me move out here and we had a good 12 hours to discuss things and we spent a solid three or four of those hours discussing excuse me discussing the possibility about ghosts being demons what the bible has to say about angels and by the time we'd gotten from denver colorado to jefferson city missouri we had conclusively come to a conclusion to be redundant there <laughs> that yes, ghosts and spirits are all actually demons and that the Bible yeah. holds a lot more answers than we thought it did. And we really need to take mm. a serious look at what the Bible says about, about the paranormal. And that mm. is when I decided to write my treatise first, which then I turned into the book. Okay. So how did that affect your ghost hunting career or activities? I mean, after you guys had that drive and that talk, like what, what, what did conclusion did you come to? Was it like, we have to stop this or was it like, because you've invested a lot in it. You've invested a lot of ego probably. 
Oh a yeah. Lot of, it, it was a, know, a bitter pill to swallow and it was rough <laughs> wrestling with pride and all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we decided that, okay, it's, it's time for us to retire from this because we're Christians. We thought we were Christians this whole time. We haven't been mm-hmm. living like it. The yeah. Bible just hit us like a punch in the gut. Like, Hey, mm-hmm. big neon sign in front of our faces. Look at what God says in his word. The word is truth. So mm-hmm. we wrestled with it, but we decided, okay, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get out of the paranormal. And that was hard because like I said, we were starting to make it. We were getting asked to speak at conventions. We just mm-hmm. captured some of the most amazing evidence in the history of paranormal investigation from what we could tell. What was that? Even though what did I was, you capture? We had, we were trying a, an experiment with a SB7 spirit box trying a new method with it that mm. yielded some really incredible in communication mm. that blew us and the other investigators we were with away. It was okay. communication on a level that was above and beyond any type of communication we'd ever seen okay. captured or presented by anybody else. Yeah, okay. It wasn't just like a single word or maybe a sentence. It was almost full on conversation. Mm, that we were getting yeah and and when we moved when i'd moved to missouri we split the team up and dylan was also moving out of state to to arizona or texas i forget which at the time Mm -hmm. so we were going to be starting three different three different groups of our team and starting to branch out nationally Mm. and we were looking forward to that Mm. we're going to have a colorado branch a missouri branch and then an Arizona branch, Arizona, yeah. Texas, wherever Dylan was at the time. So we mm-hmm. were really excited for that. And so when we got back to, when we got to Missouri and we talked about it, it's like, yeah, we're going to, going to cancel all that. We're going to stop doing this. We had one more inv- investigation that we went on hmm. in September of 2019, because we had spent a pretty penny to spend the night in a very well-known haunted location out here in Missouri that I had okay. been to before and had some pretty cool experiences at. And we okay. had another friend and his team driving out from Cheyenne, Wyoming to join us for that. Oh, okay. So instead of just <clears throat> calling it all off and wasting that money and, and whatnot, we decided, okay, we'll do this last one, just one last hurrah. And then after that, we're, we're not going to do ghost hunting anymore. Mm. And it was interesting because we did that investigation and it was so much different than any investigation we had done before. There was very little activity happening for us. The atmosphere just felt different. It was almost mm. as if the demons knew that we had figured out what they were doing. Yeah. And they didn't want to play to us, play with us anymore. Yeah. So instead of feeding us with evidence and experiences, it's kind of like they're like, okay, well, you're not you're not into this. It's your fallen God again. We don't it's like we tried for yeah. ten years almost to get you away from God and it didn't work. So reminds me of the demon saying to Jesus, uh, don't uh, send us to the pit before our time. And he sends them into the pigs instead. Yep. You know, it's like Jesus is in this situation. Now he, you guys realize, and also there's an element probably of, they don't want to have anything to do with that. Yep. And so. they probably realized, well, we're not going to be doing, anything with this investigation anyway. Mm-hmm. So why mm-hmm. should, why should we get cool evidence and cool experiences if we're not going to be trying to convince the world that they exist? Yeah. Which is kind of goes along with your thesis, which is that they're deceiving to, for purposes of deceiving the world, you know, which exactly. goes along with some of the things you said about only giving a little bit, not giving the whole story, not divulging the whole story of the afterlife. And you make some really good points about why other ghost hunters who've passed on, if, if dead people are hanging around, why haven't ghost With hunters unfinished passed business. on? Yeah. Why haven't they, why aren't they explaining it to their compatriots and saying, Hey, yeah, the spirit world is great. You know, this is yeah. how, what it's like, but there's none of that. Yeah, because one of the biggest theories is that people will die with unfinished business, so that's why they hang around. 
Mm. But mm-hmm. as paranormal investigators, if we haven't answered the question, well, what are ghosts and spirits? What's the spirit world like? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be some pretty serious unfinished business You'd that they would so. want to stick around to communicate to us? But mm-hmm. you don't have any mm-hmm. communication with former paranormal investigators. And if you watch all the shows, you really never see any sort of answer to that question. Well, is there any unfinished business yeah. that you have that you'd like to tell us? <laughs> so it's interesting right. that that's a theory when there's really no evidence or very negligible evidence to back that theory up. But it's still one of the prevalent theories that you'll hear people put forth and preach in criminal investigation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's a lot like, um, have you seen some of these faith healers and the faith healers? Well, uh, I think Todd White might be one where there's videos of him making someone's leg grow longer. Like if someone has a short leg on one side or something. And I think it was the documentary um, American Gospel, or maybe it was the sequel that talked about kind of show that and how he's just moving their hips. He's making it seem like it's growing. But the best thing that I heard out of that was, well, if he's a faith healer, like if he's healing, why isn't he going to the, uh, to the cancer ward and healing all the kids of cancer? Like why, why isn't he actually doing real hymns? Why can he only do make someone's legs supposedly grow a little bit longer? And it's the same with the demons, you know, like why are they only giving you little one word answers over the, the spirit box or why are you getting a knock here and a knock there? And of course they'll say, well, it's takes more energy to manifest and all these things. But I mean, you think in thousands and thousands of years of this, <clears throat> you would have some actual answers outside of the occult. Yeah. And of course the occult claims to have the answers and they claim to have the mysteries and everything, which is supposedly uh, acquired through divination and necromancy and whatnot, which is why God says not to do it because mm-hmm. a it's against God. B it's probably laced with tons of lies about the reality of the universe, the reality of how things are made up. Mm-hmm. Ancient um, Babylonian religion and some of that, you know, they they their magi got a lot of that information from necromancy. And so they think they were told lies about the makeup of the earth, the way uh, the gods, uh, the stories of the gods, you know, and and what they believe as far as the deities and who the creator was and all of these things. I mean, so, yeah, it's uh, it's just if someone were to come out and say uh, a a reality about the what the spirit world is like. I say someone, I mean, if, if there's a dead person that's, that's sitting there like a dead ghost hunter and they're not, why haven't they come forth and said through a spirit box, all the great things mm-hmm. about their experiencing. And so it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, Cause like mm-hmm. from my personal experience from watch, watching shows like ghost adventures from watching other paranormal teams on YouTube, you'll get mm-hmm. just enough of an answer or just enough evidence to make you think you're on to something mm-hmm. to make you want to keep doing it more <clears throat> to make yeah. you think oh well if i keep pursuing this this theory maybe i'll get mm-hmm. something and if that theory mm-hmm. hits a dead end you'll try something else that you hear and mm-hmm. maybe you'll have a little bit of success with that so you'll think oh i'm going to start pursuing that theory now so instead of coming to a conclusion that hey this is all like, like deception maybe this isn't real it's well, maybe mm-hmm. I'm not doing something right. Maybe I need to try something different and get mm-hmm. just enough to keep you going. Yeah. And I, you mentioned somewhere in the book about somewhere in the Bible where it talks about um, chirps and I, little, Isaiah. is it, was Isaiah and yep. basically to say that the dead communicate, the dead communicate in little unintelligible sort of bits and tidbits of versus a prophet or God or an angel is a clear and direct and understandable message. Yep. I came across that while I was doing my read through the Bible for the first time in like over a decade. Uh And I came across that and something hit me because during the, the convention that I spoke 
we spoke at in August of 2019. The next day during all the talks, I sat in on the medium's talk that she gave, and she mentioned something which struck me. She said that whenever her her familiar spirits communicate with her, like a, there's always like a little bit that she has to to figure out for herself. It's never a full direct answer. There's always a little bit that she kind of has to puzzle together for herself. Hmm. And then I read that in Isaiah about a year later, and I just sat up like I'd gotten struck by a lightning bolt. It was like, hmm. that, that just validated completely I bet. what that medium talked about and the fact that, that this is all demonic. Yeah. It's like the Bible says they communicate in trips and mutters, not not clear not not full messages and then this Uh medium today over 2000 years later is saying the same exact thing that was written 2000 plus years ago yeah that was a very interesting find i'd never heard that before here. Another part that I thought was really cool and insightful was when you talked about the um, Saul and the Witch of Endor episode in 1 Samuel. Uh, and one of the things that you pointed out, and, and I've, I never put this together, but I think this is a really cool insight, is that, you know, Saul had uh, forced all of the diviners and necromancers out of the land and made it illegal to do that. Mm-hmm. Then he fell out of favor with God because, and God, you know, wasn't speaking to him. So Saul took matters into his own hands and he goes and he seeks out this witch of Endor, kind of this underground kind of witch operating in the shadows. The witch knows that Saul is afraid that he's going to, well, at first she says, Saul has made this illegal. I'm not going to get in trouble, am I? And he's like, no, don't worry about it. So then he has her summon Samuel. Samuel comes up and she screams and says, what have you done? You know, he recognizes him as Saul and says, you're going to, you deceive me to, in order to get me in trouble, basically, as in you deceive me into doing a, a necromancy so that you can now kill me, didn't you? And Saul's like, no, you know, I really wanted Samuel. And I always took that. And I think it's true that that's what happened is that she was horrified that she might be getting in trouble. But the part that you pointed out that I thought was really cool and that I missed and is very interesting is that she was witnessing something. Now, now keep in mind, right, that this is something she is seeing in her head. Saul can't see it, right, because she's communicating as a medium. She's seeing this in her head. She's describing, the Bible describes what she's seen and describes Saul or uh, Samuel. And she saw a real ghost of Samuel. And because God basically resurrected Samuel or not resurrected them, but brought him to the psychic mind in some way. But your point was a demonic deception is going to be very cheap and uh, not as powerful and not as realistic. But Samuel in the witch's mind was very luminous and, you know, something obviously she was shocked. She hadn't experienced anything like that Mm -hmm. before. And that is kind of, you know, you were basically saying in your book that it shows you that um, in order for something like that to happen, God has to do it. You know, it, it shows yeah. you the even a witch who'd been doing this for years when she sees the real thing is shocked because she hasn't seen the real thing before. She's it's been am- seeing a demonic imitation. Exactly. It's an amazing compared contrast between the power of God and the deception mm-hmm. of demons, mm-hmm. especially when you take the episode of Saul and the meeting of Indoor 
and compare it to that passage from Isaiah, and you look at the mm. fact that Isaiah says mediums communicate in trips and mutters because mm. of the spirits they they communicate with, yet this medium was able to clearly see Saul and clearly uh, relay a message. He was able to clearly see Samuel and clearly relay a message to Saul from Samuel mm. that that goes completely against and is completely different from what Isaiah describes mediums from being able to do. So mm-hmm. either the Bible contradicts itself and that medium was able to somehow under her own power, be able to communicate clearly mm-hmm. or the Bible is ver- validating itself in the fact that that was God doing that, not the medium because the medium mm-hmm. wouldn't have been able to do to uh, gotten a message like that from a demon that was that clear and that real. Yeah. 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 And and even if that interpretation, and I really like that interpretation, I think there's a lot of insight to that. But even if all it is, is that somehow she was able to conjure uh, something, uh, the bottom line is that it's probably a deception. So let's say it wasn't actually Samuel and it was just uh, a demonic spirit imitating Samuel. You know, in that case, still the same rule applies is that you're dealing with, and you pointed this out in the book too, you're dealing with very powerful, ancient demons who are very smart, these spiritual beings who've been around for since the beginning, and they have observed human behavior for centuries and they remember. So don't mess with that. You're no match for that. You can't control that. And various occult people think they can control through various different means. And Christians sometimes think they can control through demonologists will think they can control through using the demon's name or what have you and through prayer and casting yeah, out. They, they think that they think that the name of Jesus or prayer is some powerful mystical type of like formula that they mm-hmm. can use to control demonic spirits, but that's not what the Bible teaches us. Yeah. Yes, we we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, God is on our side, so we already have victory over the demons. Mm-hmm. We don't need to be seeking them out. We don't need to be trying to control them because that's mm-hmm. not what we're commanded as Christians to do. Mm-hmm. We're, we're commanded as Christians to spread the gospel, and the gospel is the, the power that defeats demonic forces. Yeah. Because if you have Jesus on your side, you know victory is assured. If you don't have Jesus on your side, then then yeah, you're going to be trying to turn to, to mystical incantations or some other way to mm-hmm. to gain more <laughs> power or to gain assurance of something in the afterlife. But you mm-hmm. have no tangible, solid assurance of any sort apart from Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think the a, a similar rule or principle applies to sin in the the visual image of if you're turning towards your sin and saying no instead of looking towards God and saying yes, right? If you turn yep. towards your sin and say no, it's eventually going to pull you back in. But if you just turn to God and say yes, it's like a light turning on in a dark room. The darkness isn't there anymore because the light's exactly. there. Exactly, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's probably a similar a similar principle there. Well, um, so is there anything else? Uh, we're probably getting up to about an hour now. I'm thinking. What? what uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. That it has been. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. What? What? Is there anything else? What would you want to leave people with? Uh, as far as just anything that you would like to say in regards to the topic. I would just like people to understand that the Bible is God's word. And as God's word, God cannot lie and he's not going to lie to you in his word. And the Bible holds answers to questions beyond just the paranormal. If it has these answers for me that explain a lot of the questions and theories that I had concerning the paranormal, what questions do you have that you're wrestling with that you could find answers to and find hope and peace for by turning to God's word. Don't put the Bible to the side like I did. 
turn to God's word and let God's word bring you to God and bring you the peace of God in your life. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, man. Well, where can people find the book? People can find the book on Amazon. Just search Biblical Explanations, The Paranormal, or my name, Daniel McAdams. If you do a Google search of Biblical Explanations, The Paranormal, it'll pop up. Um, if you go to my website, 612ministries.weebly, that's W-E-E-B-L-Y.com, I have a link to the book there. We also have more resources that I'll be posting to that site as well. And that's also okay. how you can reach out to and contact me. Perfect. All right. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed the book, really enjoyed the conversation. And um, we'll talk to you later, man. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for having me on the podcast again. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Have a blessed day. <laughs>